Chapter 1 of Xerxes by Jacob Abbott, The Mother of Xerxes, B.C. 522 to 484. The name of Xerxes is associated in the minds of men with the idea of the highest attainable elevation of human magnificence and grandeur. This monarch was the sovereign of the ancient Persian Empire when it was at the height of its prosperity and power. It is probable, however, that his greatness and fame lose nothing by the manner in which his story comes down to us through the Greek historians. The Greeks conquered Xerxes, and in relating his history, they magnify the wealth, the power, and the resources of his empire by way of exalting the greatness and renown of their own exploits in subduing him. The mother of Xerxes was Atossa, a daughter of Cyrus the Great, who was the founder of the Persian Empire. Cyrus was killed in Scythia, a wild and barbarous region lying north of the Black and Caspian Seas. His son Cambyses succeeded him. A kingdom or an empire was regarded in ancient days much in the light of an estate which the sovereign held as a species of property and which he was to manage mainly with a view to the promotion of his own personal aggrandizement and pleasure. A king or an emperor could have more palaces, more money, and more wives than other men, and if he was of an overbearing or ambitious spirit, he could march into his neighbor's territories and after gratifying his love of adventure with various romantic exploits and gaining great renown by his ferocious impetuosity in battle, he could end his expedition, perhaps, by adding his neighbor's palaces and treasures and wives to his own. Divine providence, however, the mysterious power that overrules all the passions and impulses of men, and brings extended and general good out of local and particular evil, has made the ambition and the selfishness of princes the great means of preserving order and government among men. These great ancient despots, for example, would not have been able to collect their revenues, or enlist their armies, or procure supplies for their campaigns, unless their dominions were under a regular and complete system of social organization, such as should allow all the industrial pursuits of commerce and of agriculture throughout the mass of the community to go regularly on. Thus, absolute monarchs, however ambitious and selfish and domineering in their characters, have a strong personal interest in the establishment of order and of justice between man and man throughout all the regions which are under their sway. In fact, the greater their ambition, their selfishness, and their pride, the stronger will this interest be, for just in proportion as order, industry, and internal tranquility prevail in a country, just in that proportion can revenues be collected from it and armies raised and maintained. It is a mistake, therefore, to suppose of the great heroes and sovereigns and conquerors that have appeared from time to time among mankind that the usual and ordinary result of their influence and action has been that of disturbance and disorganization. It is true that a vast amount of disturbance and disorganization has often followed from the march of their armies, their sieges, their invasions, and the other local and temporary acts of violence which they commit. But these are the exceptions, not the rule. It must be that such things are exceptions since in any extended and general view of the subject, a much greater amount of social organization, industry, 
and peace is necessary to raise and maintain an army, then that army can itself destroy. The deeds of destruction which great conquerors perform attract more attention and make a greater impression upon mankind than the quiet, patient, and long-continued labors by which they perfect and extend the general organization of the social state. But these labors, though less noticed by men, have really employed the energies of great sovereigns in a far greater degree than mankind have generally imagined. Thus we should describe the work of Caesar's life in a single word more truly by saying that he organized Europe than that he conquered it. His bridges, his roads, his systems of jurisprudence, his coinage, his calendar, and other similar means and instruments of social arrangement and facilities for promoting the pursuits of industry and peace mark far more properly the real work which that great conqueror performed among mankind than his battles and his victories. Darius was, in the same way, the organizer of Asia. William the Conqueror completed or rather advanced very far toward completing the social organization of England, and even in respect to Napoleon, the true and proper memorial of his career is the successful working of the institutions, the systems, and the codes which he perfected and introduced into the social state, and not the brazen column formed from captured cannon which stands in the Place Vendôme. These considerations, obviously true, though not always borne in mind, are, however, to be considered as making the characters of the great sovereigns, in a moral point of view, neither the worse nor the better. In all that they did, whether in arranging and systematizing the functions of social life, or in ruthless deeds of conquest, and destruction, they were actuated in a great measure by selfish ambition. They arranged and organized the social state in order to form a more compact and solid pedestal for the foundation of their power. They maintained peace and order among their people, just as a master would suppress quarrels among his slaves because peace among laborers is essential to productive results. They fixed and defined legal rights and established courts to determine and enforce them. They protected property. They counted and classified men. They opened roads. They built bridges. They encouraged commerce. They hung robbers and exterminated pirates all that the collection of their revenues and the enlistment of their armies might go on without hindrance or restriction. Many of them, indeed, may have been animated in some degree by a higher and nobler sentiment than this. Some may have felt a sort of pride in the contemplation of a great and prosperous and wealthy empire, analogous to that which a proprietor feels in surveying a well-conditioned, successful, and productive estate. Others, like Alfred, may have felt a sincere and honest interest in the welfare of their fellow men, and the promotion of human happiness may have been, in a greater or less degree, the direct object of their aim. Still, it cannot be denied that a selfish and reckless ambition has been, in general, the mainspring of action with heroes and conquerors, which, while it aimed only at personal aggrandizement, has been made to operate through the peculiar mechanism of the social state which the divine wisdom has contrived as a means, in the main, of preserving and extending peace and order among mankind, and not of destroying them. But to return to Atassa, her father Cyrus, who laid the foundation of the great Persian Empire, was for a hero and conqueror 
tolerably considerate and just, and he desired, probably, to promote the welfare and happiness of his millions of subjects. But his son Cambyses, Atossa's brother, having been brought up in expectation of succeeding to vast wealth and power, and having been, as the sons of the wealthy and the powerful often are in all ages of the world, wholly neglected by his father during the early part of his life, and entirely unaccustomed to control, became a wild, reckless, proud, selfish, and ungovernable young man. His father was killed suddenly in battle, as has already been stated, and Cambyses succeeded him. Cambyses's career was short, desperate, and most tragical in its end. In fact, he was one of the most savage, reckless, and abominable monsters that have ever lived. It was the custom in those days for the Persian monarchs to have many wives, and what is still more remarkable, whenever any monarch died, his successor inherited his predecessor's family, as well as his throne. Cyrus had several children by his various wives. Cambyses and Smyrdas were the only sons, but there were daughters, among whom Atossa was the most distinguished. The ladies of the court were accustomed to reside in different palaces or in different suites of apartments in the same palace so that they lived in a great measure isolated from each other. When Cambyses came to the throne and thus entered into possession of his father's palaces, he saw and fell in love with one of his father's daughters. He wished to make her one of his wives. He was accustomed to the unrestricted indulgence of every appetite and passion, but he seems to have had some slight misgivings in regard to such a step as this. He consulted the Persian judges. They conferred upon the subject and then replied that they had searched among the laws of the realm, and though they found no law allowing a man to marry his sister, they found many which authorized a Persian king to do whatever he pleased. Cambyses, therefore, added the princess to the number of his wives, and not long afterward he married another of his father's daughters in the same way. One of these princesses was Atossa. Cambyses invaded Egypt, and in the course of his mad career in that country, he killed his brother Smyrdas and one of his sisters, and at length was killed himself. Atossa escaped the dangers of this stormy and terrible reign, and returned safely to Susa after Cambyses's death. Smyrdas, the brother of Cambyses, would have been Cambyses's successor if he had survived him, but he had been privately assassinated by Cambyses's orders, though his death had been kept profoundly secret by those who had perpetrated the deed. There was another Smyrdas in Susa, the Persian capital, who was a Magian, that is, a sort of priest, in whose hands, as regent, Cambyses had left the government while he was absent on his campaigns. This Magian, Smyrdas, accordingly conceived the plan of usurping the throne as if he were Smyrdas the prince, resorting to a great many ingenious and cunning schemes to conceal his deception. Among his other plans, one was to keep himself wholly sequestered from public view, with a few favorites, such especially as had not personally known Smyrdas the prince. In the same manner, he secluded from each other and from himself all who had known Smyrdas in order to prevent their conferring with one another or communicating to each other any suspicions which they might chance to entertain. Such seclusion, so far as related to the ladies of the royal family, was not unusual after the death of a king, and Smyrdas did not deviate from the ordinary custom except to make the isolation 
and confinement of the princesses and queens more rigorous and strict than common. By means of this policy, he was enabled to go on for some months without detection, living all the while in the greatest luxury and splendor, but at the same time in absolute seclusion and in unceasing anxiety and fear. One chief source of his solicitude was lest he should be detected by means of his ears. Some years before, when he was in a comparatively obscure position, he had in some way or other offended his sovereign and was punished by having his ears cut off. It was necessary, therefore, to keep the marks of this mutilation carefully concealed by means of his hair and his headdress, and even with these precautions he could never feel perfectly secure. At last one of the nobles of the court, a sagacious and observing man, suspected the imposture. He had no access to Smyrtus himself, but his daughter, whose name was Phaedema, was one of Smyrtus's wives. The nobleman was excluded from all direct intercourse with Smyrtus and even with his daughter, but he contrived to send word to his daughter inquiring whether her husband was the true Smyrtus or not. She replied that she did not know, inasmuch as she had never seen any other Smyrtus, if indeed there had been another. The nobleman then attempted to communicate with Atossa, but he found it impossible to do so. Atossa had, of course, known her brother well, and was on that very account very closely secluded by the Magian. As a last resort, the nobleman sent to his daughter a request that she should watch for an opportunity to feel for her husband's ears while he was asleep. He admitted that this would be a dangerous attempt, but his daughter, he said, ought to be willing to make it, since if her pretended husband were really an impostor, she ought to take even a stronger interest than others in his detection. Fadima was at first afraid to undertake so dangerous a commission, but she at length ventured to do so, and by passing her hand under his turban one night while he was sleeping on his couch, she found that the ears were gone. The consequence of this discovery was that a conspiracy was formed to dethrone and destroy the usurper. The plot was successful. Smyrtus was killed, his imprisoned queens were set free, and Darius was raised to the throne in his stead. Atossa now, by that strange principle of succession which has been already alluded to, became the wife of Darius, and she figures frequently and conspicuously in history during his long and splendid reign. Her name is brought into notice in one case in a remarkable manner in connection with an expedition which Darius sent on an exploring tour into Greece and Italy. She herself the means, in fact, of sending the expedition. She was sick, and after suffering secretly and in silence as long as possible, the nature of her complaint being such as to make her unwilling to speak of it to others, she at length determined to consult a Greek physician who had been brought to Persia as a captive and had acquired great celebrity at Susa by his medical science and skill. The physician said that he would undertake her case on condition that she would promise to grant him a certain request that he would make. She wished to know what it was beforehand, but the physician would not tell her. He said, however, that it was nothing that it would be in any way derogatory to her honor to grant him. On these conditions, Atossa concluded to agree to the physician's proposals. He made her take a solemn oath that, 
If he cured her of her malady, she would do whatever he required of her, provided that it was consistent with honor and propriety. He then took her case under his charge, prescribed for her and attended her, and in due time she was cured. The physician then told her that what he wished her to do for him was to find some means to persuade Darius to send him home to his native land. Atasa was faithful in fulfilling her promise. She took a private opportunity when she was alone with Darius to propose that he should engage in some plans of foreign conquest. She reminded him of the vastness of the military power which was at his disposal and of the facility with which, by means of it, he might extend his dominions. She extolled, too, his genius and energy, and endeavored to inspire in his mind some ambitious desires to distinguish himself in the estimation of mankind by bringing his capacities for the performance of great deeds into action. Darius listened to these suggestions of Atasa with interest and with evident pleasure. He said that he had been forming some such plans himself. He was going to build a bridge across the Hell's Point or the Bosphorus to unite Europe and Asia, and he was also going to make an incursion into the country of the Scythians, the people by whom Cyrus, his great predecessor, had been defeated and slain. It would be a great glory for him, he said, to succeed in a conquest in which Cyrus had so totally failed. But these plans would not answer the purpose which Atossa had in view. She urged her husband, therefore, to postpone his invasion of the Scythians till some future time, and first conquer the Greeks, and annex their territory to his dominions. The Scythians, she said, were savages, and their country not worth the cost of conquering it, while Greece would constitute a noble prize. She urged the invasion of Greece, too, rather than Scythia, as a personal favor to herself, for she had been wanting, she said, some slaves from Greece for a long time. Some of the women of Sparta, of Corinth, and of Athens, of whose graces and accomplishments she had heard so much. There was something gratifying to the military vanity of Darius in being thus requested to make an incursion to another continent and undertake the conquest of the mightiest nation of the earth for the purpose of procuring accomplished waiting maids to offer as a present to his queen. He became restless and excited while listening to Atossa's proposals and to the arguments with which she enforced them, and it was obvious that he was very strongly inclined to accede to her views. He finally concluded to send a commission into Greece to explore the country and to bring back a report on their return, and as he decided to make the Greek physician the guide of the expedition, Atossa gained her end. A full account of this expedition and of the various adventures which the party met with on their voyage is given in our history of Darius. It may be proper to say here, however, that the physician fully succeeded in his plans of making his escape. He pretended at first to be unwilling to go, and he made only the most temporary arrangements in respect to the conduct of his affairs while he should be gone, in order to deceive the king in regard to his intentions of not returning. The king, on his part, resorted to some stratagems to ascertain whether the physician was sincere in his professions, but he did not succeed in detecting the artifice, and so the party went away. The physician never returned. Atossa had four sons. Xerxes was the eldest of them. He was not, however, the eldest of the sons of Darius, as there were other sons, the children of another wife, whom Darius had married 
before he ascended the throne. The oldest of these children was named Artobazanes. Artobazanes seems to have been a prince of an amiable and virtuous character, and not particularly ambitious and aspiring in his disposition. Although, as he was the eldest son of his father, he claimed to be his heir. Atossa did not admit the validity of this claim, but maintained that the eldest of her children was entitled to the inheritance. It became necessary to decide this question before Darius's death, for Darius, in the prosecution of a war in which he was engaged, formed the design of accompanying his army on an expedition into Greece, and before doing this, he was bound, according to the laws and usages of the Persian realm, to regulate the succession. There immediately arose an earnest dispute between the friends and partisans of Artobazanes and Xerxes, each side urging very eagerly the claims of its own candidate. The mother and the friends of Artobazanes maintained that he was the oldest son, and consequently the heir. Atossa, on the other hand, contended that Xerxes was the grandson of Cyrus, and that he derived from that circumstance the highest possible hereditary rights to the Persian throne. This was in some respects true, for Cyrus had been the founder of the empire and the legitimate monarch, while Darius had no hereditary claims. He was originally a noble of high rank, indeed, but not of the royal line, and he had been designated as Cyrus's successor in a time of revolution, because there was, at that time, no prince of the royal family who could take the inheritance. Those, therefore, who were disposed to insist on the claims of a legitimate hereditary succession might very plausibly claim that Darius's government had been a regency rather than a reign, that Xerxes, being the oldest son of Atossa, Cyrus's daughter, was the true representative of the royal line, and that although it might not be expedient to disturb the possession of Darius during his lifetime, yet that at his death Xerxes was unquestionably entitled to the throne. There was obviously a great deal of truth and justice in this reasoning, and yet it was a view of the subject not likely to be very agreeable to Darius, since it seemed to deny the existence of any real and valid title to the sovereignty in him. It assigned the crown at his death not to his son as such, but to his predecessor's grandson, for though Xerxes was both the son of Darius and the grandson of Cyrus, it was in the latter capacity that he was regarded as entitled to the throne in the argument referred to above. The doctrine was very gratifying to the pride of Atossa, for it made Xerxes the successor to the crown as her son and heir, and not as the son and heir of her husband. For this very reason, it was likely to be not very gratifying to Darius. He hesitated very much in respect to adopting it. Atossa's ascendancy over his mind and her influence generally in the Persian court was almost overwhelming, and yet Darius was very unwilling to seem, by giving to the oldest grandson of Cyrus the precedence over his own eldest son, to admit that he himself had no legitimate and proper title to the throne. While things were in this state, a Greek named Demaratus arrived at Susa. He was a dethroned prince from Sparta and had fled from the political storms of his own country to seek refuge in Darius's capital, 
Demaratus found a way to reconcile Darius's pride as a sovereign with his personal preferences as a husband and a father. He told the king that, according to the principles of hereditary succession which were adopted in Greece, Xerxes was his heir as well as Cyrus's, for he was the oldest son who was born after his accession. A son, he said, according to the Greek ideas on the subject, was entitled to inherit only such rank as his father held when the son was born, and that consequently none of his children who had been born before his accession could have any claims to the Persian throne. Artobazanes, in a word, was to be regarded, he said, only as the son of Darius the noble, while Xerxes was the son of Darius the king. In the end, Darius adopted this view and designated Xerxes as his successor in case he should not return from his distant expedition. He did not return. He did not even live to set out upon it. Perhaps the question of the succession had not been absolutely and finally settled, for it arose again and was discussed anew when the death of Darius occurred. The manner in which it was finally disposed of will be described in the next chapter. End of chapter 1「Xerxes, Egypt and Greece, B.C. 484. The arrangements which Darius had made to fix and determine the succession before his death did not entirely prevent the question from arising again when his death occurred. Xerxes was on the spot at the time and at once assumed the royal functions. His brother was absent. Xerxes sent a message to Artobazanes, informing him of their father's death and of his intention of assuming the crown. He said, however, that if he did so, he should give his brother the second rank, making him, in all respects, next to himself in office and honor. He sent, moreover, a great many splendid presents to Artobazanes to evince the friendly regard which he felt for him, and to propitiate his favor. Artobazanes sent back word to Xerxes that he thanked him for his presents, and that he accepted them with pleasure. He said that he considered himself, nevertheless, as justly entitled to the crown, though he should, in the event of his accession, treat all his brothers, and especially Xerxes, with the utmost consideration and respect. Soon after these occurrences, Artobazanes came to Media, where Xerxes was, and the question of which of them should be the king was agitated anew among the nobles of the court. In the end, a public hearing of the cause was had before Artabanus, a brother of Darius, and of course an uncle of the contending princes. The question seems to have been referred to him, either because he held some public office which made it his duty to consider and decide such a question, or else because he had been specially commissioned to act as judge in this particular case. Xerxes was at first quite unwilling to submit his claims to the decision of such a tribunal. The crown was, as he maintained, rightfully his. He thought that the public voice was generally in his favor. Then, besides, he was already in possession of the throne, and by consenting to plead his cause before his uncle, he seemed to be virtually abandoning all this vantage ground, and trusting instead to the mere chance of Artabanus's decision. Atossa, however, recommended to him to accede to the plan of referring the question to Artabanus. He would consider the subject, she said, with fairness and impartiality, 
and decide it right. She had no doubt that he would decide it in Xerxes' favor, and if he does not, she added, and you lose your cause, you only become the second man in the kingdom instead of the first, and the difference is not so very great after all. Atossa may have had some secret intimation how Artabanus would decide. However this may be, Xerxes at length concluded to submit the question. A solemn court was held, and the case was argued in the presence of all the nobles and great officers of state. A throne was at hand to which the successful competitor was to be conducted as soon as the decision should be made. Artabanus heard the arguments and decided in favor of Xerxes. Artobazanes, his brother, acquiesced in the decision with the utmost readiness and good humor. He was the first to bow before the king in token of homage, and conducted him himself to the throne. Xerxes kept his promise faithfully of making his brother the second in his kingdom. He appointed him to a very high command in the army, and Ardo Bazanes, on his part, served the king with great zeal and fidelity until he was at last killed in battle in the manner hereafter to be described. As soon as Xerxes found himself established on his throne, he was called upon to decide immediately a great question, namely, which of two important wars in which his father had been engaged he should first undertake to prosecute, the war in Egypt or the war in Greece. By referring to the map, the reader will see that, as the Persian Empire extended westward to Asia Minor and to the coasts of the Mediterranean Sea, the great countries which bordered upon it in this direction were on the north Greece and on the south Egypt, the one in Europe and the other in Africa. The Greeks and the Egyptians were both wealthy and powerful, and the countries which they respectively inhabited were fertile and beautiful beyond expression. And yet in all their essential features and characteristics, they were extremely dissimilar. Egypt was a long and narrow inland valley. Greece reposed, as it were, in the bosom of the sea, consisting, as it did, of an endless number of islands, promontories, peninsulas, and winding coasts, laved on every side by the blue waters of the Mediterranean. Egypt was a plain, diversified only by the varieties of vegetation and by the towns and villages, and the enormous monumental structures which had been erected by man. Greece was a picturesque and ever-changing scene of mountains and valleys, of precipitous cliffs, winding beaches, rocky capes, and lofty headlands. The character and genius of the inhabitants of these two countries took their cast, in each case, from the physical conformities of the soil. The Egyptians were a quiet, gentle, and harmless race of tillers of the ground. They spent their lives in pumping water from the river, in the patient, persevering toil of sowing smooth and mellow fields, or in reaping the waving grain. The Greeks drove flocks and herds up and down the declivities of the mountains, or hunted wild beasts in forests and fastnesses. They constructed galleys for navigating the seas. They worked the mines and manufactured metals. They built bridges, citadels, temples, and towns, and sculptured statuary from marble blocks which they chiseled from the strata of the mountains. It is surprising what a difference is made in the genius and character of man by elevations, here and there, of a few thousand feet in the country where his genius and character are formed. The architectural wonders of Egypt and of Greece were as diverse from each other as the natural features of the soil, 
and in each case the structures were in keeping and in harmony with the character of the landscape which they respectively adorned. The harmony was, however, that of contrast and not of correspondence. In Greece, where the landscape itself was grand and sublime, the architect aimed only at beauty. To have aimed at magnitude and grandeur in human structures among the mountains, the cliffs, the cataracts, and the resounding ocean shores of Greece would have been absurd. The Grecian artists were deterred by their unerring instincts from the attempt. They accordingly built beautiful temples, whose white and symmetrical colonnades adorned the declivities or crowned the summits of the hills. They sculptured statues to be placed on pedestals in groves and gardens. They constructed fountains. They raised bridges and aqueducts on long ranges of arches and piers, and the summits of ragged rocks crystallized, as it were, under their hands into towers, battlements, and walls. In Egypt, on the other hand, where the country itself was a level and unvarying plain, the architecture took forms of prodigious magnitude, of lofty elevation, and of vast extent. There were ranges of enormous columns, colossal statues, towering obelisks, and pyramids rising like mountains from the verdure of the plain. Thus, while nature gave to the country its elements of beauty, man completed the landscape by adding to it the grand and the sublime. The shape and proportions of Egypt would be represented by a green ribbon an inch wide and a yard long lying upon the ground in a serpentine form. And to complete the model, we might imagine a silver filament passing along the center of the green to denote the Nile. The real valley of verdure, however, is not of uniform breadth, like the ribbons so representing it, but widens as it approaches the sea, as if there had been originally a gulf or estuary there, which the sediment from the river had filled. In fact, the rich and fertile plain which the alluvial deposits of the Nile have formed has been protruded for some distance into the sea, and the stream divides itself into three great branches about a hundred miles from its mouth, two outermost of which, with the sea coast in front, enclose a vast triangle which was called the delta, from the Greek letter delta, which is of a triangular form. In ascending the river beyond the delta, the fertile plain, at first twenty-five or thirty miles wide, grows gradually narrower as the ranges of barren hills and tracts of sandy deserts on either hand draw nearer and nearer to the river. Thus the country consists of two long lines of rich and fertile intervals, one on each side of the stream. In the time of Xerxes, the whole extent was densely populated, every little elevation of the land being covered with a village or a town. The inhabitants tilled the land, raising upon it vast stores of corn, much of which was floated down the river to its mouth and taken thence to various countries of Europe and Asia in merchant ships over the Mediterranean Sea. Caravans, too, sometimes came across the neighboring deserts to obtain supplies of Egyptian corn. This was done by the sons of Jacob when the crops failed them in the land of Canaan, as related in the sacred scriptures. There were two great natural wonders in Egypt in ancient times as now. First, it never rained there, or at least so seldom, that the rain was regarded as a marvelous phenomenon, interrupting the ordinary course of nature, like an earthquake in England or America. The falling of drops of water out of clouds in the sky was an occurrence so strange, so unaccountable, that the whole population regarded it with astonishment and awe. 
With the exception of these rare and wonder-exciting instances, there was no rain, no snow, no hail, no clouds in the sky. The sun was always shining, and the heavens were always serene. These meteorological characteristics of the country, resulting as they do from permanent natural causes, continue, of course, unchanged to the present day, and the Arabs who live now along the banks of the river keep their crops, when harvested, in heaps in the open air, and require no roofs to their huts except a light covering of sheaves to protect the inmates from the sun. The other natural wonder of Egypt was the annual rising of the Nile. About midsummer, the peasantry who lived along the banks would find the river gradually beginning to rise. The stream became more turbid, too, as the bosom of the waters swelled. No cause for this mysterious increase appeared, as the sky remained as blue and serene as before, and the sun, then nearly vertical, continued to shine with even more than its wonted splendor. The inhabitants, however, felt no surprise and asked for no explanation of the phenomenon. It was the common course of nature at that season. They had all witnessed it year after year from childhood. They, of course, looked for it when the proper month came round, and though they would have been amazed if the annual flood had failed, they thought nothing extraordinary of its coming. When the swelling of the waters and the gradual filling of the channels and low grounds in the neighborhood of the river warned the people that the flood was at hand, they all engaged busily in the work of completing their preparations. The harvests were all gathered from the fields, and the vast stores of fruit and corn which they yielded were piled in roofless granaries, built on every elevated spot of ground where they would be safe from the approaching inundation. The rise of the water was very gradual and slow. Streams began to flow in all directions over the land. Ponds and lakes, growing every day more and more extended, spread mysteriously over the surface of the meadows, and all the time while this deluge of water was rising to submerge the land, the air continued dry, the sun was sultry, and the sky was without a cloud. As the flood continued to rise, the proportion of land and water, and the conformation of the irregular and temporary shores which separated them, were changed continually from day to day. The inhabitants assembled in their villages, which were built on rising grounds, some natural, others artificially formed. The waters rose more and more until only these crowded islands appeared above its surface, when at length the valley presented to the view the spectacle of a vast expanse of water, calm as a summer sea, brilliant with the reflected rays of a tropical sun, and canopied by a sky which displayed its spotless blue by day and its countless stars at night, was always cloudless and serene. The inundation was at its height in October. After that period, the waters gradually subsided, leaving a slimy and very fertilizing deposit all over the lands which they had covered. Though the inhabitants themselves, who had been accustomed to this overflow from infancy, felt no wonder or curiosity about its cause, the philosophers of the day and travelers from other countries who visited Egypt made many attempts to seek an explanation of the phenomenon. They had three theories on the subject which Herodotus mentions and discusses. The first explanation was that the rising of the river was occasioned by the prevalence of northerly winds on the Mediterranean at that time of the year, which drove back the waters at the mouth of the river, and so caused the accumulation of the water in the upper parts of the valley. Herodotus thought that this was not a satisfactory explanation 
for sometimes, as he said, these northerly winds did not blow, and yet the rising of the river took place none the less when the appointed season came. Besides, there were other rivers similarly situated in respect to the influence of prevailing winds at sea in driving in the waters at their mouths, which were, nevertheless, not subject to inundations like the Nile. The second theory was that the Nile took its rise not like other rivers in inland lakes or among inland mountains, but in some remote and unknown ocean on the other side of the continent, which ocean the advocates of this theory supposed might be subject to some great annual ebb and flow, and from this it might result that at stated periods an unusual tide of waters might be poured into the channel of the river. This, however, could not be true, for the waters of the inundation were fresh, not salt, which proved that they were not furnished by any ocean. The third hypothesis was that the rising of the water was occasioned by the melting of the snows in summer on the mountains from which the sources of the river came. Against this supposition, Herodotus found more numerous and more satisfactory reasons even than he had advanced against the others. In the first place, the river came from the south, a direction in which the heat increased in intensity with every league as far as travelers had explored it, and beyond those limits they supposed that the burning sun made the country uninhabitable. It was preposterous to suppose that there could be snow and ice there. Then, besides, the Nile had been ascended to a great distance, and reports from the natives had been brought down from regions still more remote, and no tidings had ever been brought of ice and snow. It was unreasonable, therefore, to suppose that the inundations could arise from such a cause. These scientific theories, however, were discussed only among philosophers and learned men. The common people had a much more simple and satisfactory mode of disposing of the subject. They, in their imaginations, invested the beneficent river with a sort of life and personality, and when they saw its waters rising so gently, but yet surely, to overflow their whole land, leaving it, as they withdrew again, endued with a new and exuberant fertility, they imagined it a living and acting intelligence, that in the exercise of some mysterious and inscrutable powers, the nature of which was to them unknown, and impelled by a kind and friendly regard for the country and its inhabitants, came annually of its own accord to spread over the land the blessings of fertility and abundance. The mysterious stream being viewed in this light, its wonderful powers awakened their veneration and awe, and its boundless beneficence their gratitude. Among the ancient Egyptian legends, there is one relating to a certain King Pharaoh, which strikingly illustrates this feeling. It seems that during one of the inundations, while he was standing with his courtiers and watching the flow of the water, the commotion in the stream was much greater than usual on account of a strong wind which was blowing at that time and which greatly increased the violence of the whirlpools and the force and swell of the boiling eddies. There was given, in fact, to the appearance of the river an expression of anger, and Farron, who was of a proud and haughty character, like most of the Egyptian kings, threw his javelin into one of the wildest of the whirlpools as a token of his defiance of its rage. He was instantly struck blind. The sequel of the story is curious, though it has no connection with the personality of the Nile. Farron remained blind for ten years. At the end of that time, it was announced to him by some supernatural communication 
that the period of his punishment had expired, and that his sight might be brought back to him by the employment of a certain designated means of restoration, which was the bathing of his eyes by a strictly virtuous woman. Farron undertook compliance with the requisition without any idea that the finding of a virtuous woman would be a difficult task. He tried first his own wife, but her bathing produced no effect. He then tried, one after another, various ladies of his court, and afterwards others of different rank and station, selecting those who were most distinguished for the excellence of their characters. He was disappointed, however, in them all. The blindness continued unchanged. At last, however, he found the wife of a peasant whose bathing produced the effect. The monarch's sight was suddenly restored. The king rewarded the peasant woman whose virtuous character was established by this indisputable test with the highest honors. The others he collected together and then shut them up in one of his towns. When they were all thus safely imprisoned, he set the town on fire and burned them all up together. To return to the Nile, certain columns were erected in different parts of the valley on which cubits and the subdivisions of cubits were marked and numbered for the purpose of ascertaining precisely the rise of the water. Such a column was called a Nileometer. There was one near Memphis which was at the upper point of the delta and others further up the river. Such pillars continued to be used to mark the height of the inundations to the present day. The object of thus accurately ascertaining the rise of the water was not mere curiosity, for there were certain important business operations which depended upon the results. The fertility and productiveness of the soil each year were determined almost wholly by the extent of the inundation, and as the ability of the people to pay tribute depended upon their crops, the Nileometer furnished the government with a criterion by which they regulated the annual assessment of the taxes. There were certain canals, too, made to convey the water to distant tracts of land, which were opened or kept closed according as the water rose to a higher or lower point. All these things were regulated by the indications of the Nileometer. Egypt was famed in the days of Xerxes for those enormous structures and ruins of structures whose origin was then, as now, lost in a remote antiquity. Herodotus found the pyramids standing in his day and presenting the same spectacle of mysterious and solitary grandeur which they exhibited to Napoleon. He speculated on their origin and their history, just as the philosophers and travelers of our day do. In fact, he knew less and could learn less about them than is known now. It helps to impress our minds with an idea of the extreme antiquity of these and the other architectural wonders of Egypt to compare them with things which are considered old in the Western world. The ancient and venerable colleges and halls of Oxford and Cambridge are, many of them, two or three hundred years old. There are remains of the old wall of the city of London, which has been standing seven hundred years. This is considered a great antiquity. There are, however, Roman ruins in Britain and in various parts of Europe, more ancient still. They have been standing 1,800 years. People look upon these with a species of wonder and awe that they have withstood the destructive influences of time so long. But as to the pyramids, if we go back 2,500 years, we find travelers visiting and describing them then. Monuments as ancient, as venerable, as mysterious, and unknown in their eyes as they appear now in ours. We judge that a mountain is very distant when, 
after traveling many miles toward it, it seems still as distant as ever. Now in tracing the history of the pyramids, the obelisks, the gigantic statues, and the vast columnar ruins of the Nile, we may go back 2,500 years without apparently making any progress whatever toward reaching their origin. Such was Egypt. Isolated as it was from the rest of the world, and full of fertility and riches, it offered a marked and definite object to the ambition of a conqueror. In fact, on account of the peculiar interest which this long and narrow valley of verdure, with its wonderful structures, the strange and anomalous course of nature which prevails in it, and the extraordinary phases which human life, in consequence, exhibits there, has always excited among mankind, heroes and conquerors have generally considered it a peculiarly glorious field for their exploits. Cyrus, the founder of the Persian monarchy, contemplated the subjugation of it. He did not carry his designs into effect, but left them for Cambyses, his son. Darius held the country as a dependency during his reign, though near the close of his life it revolted. This revolt took place while he was preparing for his grand expedition against Greece, and he was perplexed with the question which of the two undertakings, the subjugation of the Egyptians or the invasion of Greece, he should first engage in. In the midst of this uncertainty, he suddenly died, leaving both the wars themselves and the perplexity of deciding between them as a part of the royal inheritance falling to his son. Xerxes decided to prosecute the Egyptian campaign first, intending to postpone the conquest of Greece till he had brought the valley of the Nile once more under Persian sway. He deemed it dangerous to leave a province of his father's empire in a state of successful rebellion, while leading his armies off to new undertakings. Mardonius, who was the commander-in-chief of the army and the great general on whom Xerxes mainly relied for the execution of his schemes, was very reluctant to consent to this plan. He was impatient for the conquest of Greece. There was little glory for him to acquire in merely suppressing a revolt and reconquering what had been already once subdued. He was eager to enter upon a new field. Xerxes, however, overruled his wishes, and the armies commenced their march for Egypt. They passed the land of Judea on their way, where the captives who had returned from Babylon and their successors were rebuilding the cities and reoccupying the country. Xerxes confirmed them in the privileges which Cyrus and Darius had granted them and aided them in their work. He then went on toward the Nile. The rebellion was easily put down. In less than a year from the time of leaving Susa, he had reconquered the whole land of Egypt, punished the leaders of the revolt, established his brother as viceroy of the country, and returned in safety to Susa. All this took place in the second year of his reign. End of chapter 2